Hi, and welcome to Stardo, the show for the American entrepreneur. I'm Chris Franks, founder and CEO of Mobilify, a company that helps turn shy and reclusive you into a networking ninja. As a brand new startup, when you begin handling customers' personal information, a single misstep can prove costly or even fatal for your company. In the studio with us tonight is privacy expert, Peter Cranstone, who will talk us through the rules of the game when it comes to privacy. In our drawing board segment, intellectual property attorney, Jeffrey Cass, will explain what constitutes a trade or business secret. All that, plus our office freak out of the week, tonight on Stardo. So what's new in the world of entrepreneurship? A watch that connects directly to your smartphone called the Pebble broke every crowdfunding record in the universe this week by raising $3.7 million on Kickstarter in the first seven days. The Pebble Watch acts as a window into your smartphone by allowing you to control music apps, receive text, and see your caller ID. Best of all, it tells you what time it is. The former Y Combinator company hadn't run into funding roadblocks as the venture capital community was apparently reluctant to invest in their hardware play. So they posted their project on the crowdfunding site Kickstarter where donors were able to pre-order the product. Their goal, $100,000 in funding. The result, $5.3 million in counting from 35,000 backers. I wonder how many calls they are fielding from the VCs now. If you haven't received at least one branch out request in the past few months, you either don't have a Facebook account or you do, but you're under the age of 12. Branch Out, an insurgent professional social network, has declared war on LinkedIn, and by many accounts, they are winning. Branch Out recently topped 25 million registered users on an incredible growth curve. We're talking three new users every second. They started inside the Facebook world, but according to the company, roughly 40% of their traffic is now coming from their mobile application, which launched in December. With Facebook's initial public offering on May the 17th, one has to wonder whether or not Mr. Zuckerberg is looking to bring Branch Out into the Facebook family. But Branch Out founder Rick Marini has stated publicly that getting bought by a bigger company is not in their plans. Regardless, the company will have plenty of cash on hand. They announced this week that they closed a $25 million C round of financing led by the Mayfield Fund. Speaking of funding, we've been hearing a lot of buzz about President Obama's signing of the Jobs Act. The centerpiece of the legislation establishes new guidelines for crowdfunding. When this law goes into effect, visitors to websites such as Kickstarter and Indiegogo will be able to fund companies and receive equity in return. Leaders in the startup community have been pushing for this for nearly a decade. Now that it's finally here, what does this mean? Startup Iowa's Christian Renault joins us from Des Moines to explain. Hi Christian, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm dying to ask you about the Jobs Act, but before we get into that, tell us what's going on in Startup Iowa. We're having a lot of fun. We announced as the eighth region of the Startup America Partnership last December, and we've had a major event essentially every month since. January, we had a statewide trade show for all of our startups. 100 plus startups, 400 plus customers, seven different locations, a bunch of people sold a lot of product. It was a great time. February, we did a centralized event calendar, so startups can find all the great things going on entrepreneurially around the state. In March, we did a, a wiki of essentially all of the learnings about being a startup in Iowa, so all these guys can share knowledge amongst each other. And then in April, we're doing what we call Open Iowa, which is a hackathon of government data, but not only state data, but also Fed, county, and city data throughout the so state. So tell us a little bit about the JOBS Act and what do you think it means for entrepreneurs around the country? I think it means different things depending on where you are in the country. I mean, if there's a lot of talk about the coasts being startup bubble and being overcapitalized and valuations going through the roof. But if you look at where we are historically, and I've been in this market for a long time, I got a lot of gray hair around my little Princess Leia headphones here. No hair here. But uh, you, you got me beat, though. Um, if you look at where the community is, it's never been cheaper to do a startup, especially tech startups, right? So you have the Jobs Act that comes out has things like crowdfunding and says, now I can get people coming in like Kickstarter, your earlier point, and they can start putting money towards these startups that have less capital needs and really 
create a lot of new business, a lot of new startups, a lot of new jobs with very, very little risk. And it really democratizes the investing community versus just restricted to a few high net worth individuals and venture funds. What are, what are the risks for startups in doing this? Is there a, a high regulatory barrier that we have to, to overcome? Well, when they did the Jobs Act, what they did is they, they sort of comprehensively looked at things like SEC regulation A, I think it's A, and then D, certainly, and some of the IPO filing requirements. And what they did is they really dialed those back. They told the SEC they needed to go back and reevaluate some of these things, like how people announce that they're going to do fundraising. Reg do you see a big glut of crowdfunding sites and companies being formed in the next, you know, probably six months or so? I wish I could figure out some way to get paid for the number of companies that pop up out of the woodwork. <laughs> you know, we have three million people in the state of Iowa. I know six guys or six companies just in this state that are starting crowdfunding websites. So that's three million of what's the U.S. population, 300 million? So if you want to do some basic math, I think there are going to be a few of those folks. And there's going to be this Cambrian explosion of all these different folks that come up with all sorts of different ideas on how to skin this cat. And there'll be a lot of attrition, a lot of, you know, face plants and so forth. And there'll be a, a few clear winners that emerge from that two, three, four years from now, a lot of market consolidation. It'll be a really fun time to see a lot of business models tried and succeeded or tried and failed. So summarize what the JOBS Act means for American entrepreneurs. So it means, it means quite a few things, but the, the Cliff Notes version is crowdfunding is something that's been a lot overdue, if you think about it. Look at the last 10 years of what it means to start a company. And you got Moore's Law, you got cloud computing, you're driving the cost of building tech startups way down, lower than they've ever historically been. So you have these smaller capital requirements for startups, and then you have anybody individually who can then go invest in those companies in areas that they know. Maybe you know the tech startup down the block. You can invest in those, and you're not prohibited from doing it. That's awesome. Christian, thanks so much for your time. Hey, thanks for having me. Let us know your thoughts by hitting us up on Twitter, at StartoTV, or on Facebook at facebook.com slash StartoTV. We'll be right back. It takes all this to bring you this. You need all this to get this. Hi, I'm Yul Kwan. Join me as we travel across the country and discover the who, what, where, and wow of what makes America work. This is America Revealed. Wednesdays at 10, 9 central, starting April 11, only on PBS. Welcome back to Stardo, the show for the American entrepreneur. Ladies and gentlemen, starting a company is hard. Whether you're trying to start a big internet company that serves as the permanent replacement for business cards, like me, or you're starting a mom and pop retail store. The entrepreneurial path can be a long and lonely trail. The question is, why do we do it? Why do we go out there and fight the good fight? Now, for many of us, the answer is simple. We struggle in the big company setting. When we're forced to work in the big office, bad things happen. Office freak out of the week. <laughs> Office freak out of the week. I got nothing. I mean, that's, I mean, I, 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 does that pretty much say it? Here's my question. Honestly, do you really blame that guy? I mean, sure, he flipped out. Maybe he's going to jail for assault. Well, I don't know. I love the guy who runs after him, like, Peter, come back. To escape the dangers of the office setting, you need to come up with a big idea. Once you do, how do you protect it? If you share it with your employees, how can you be assured they won't steal it and start their own company? What about the bank? What about potential investors or friends or your web developer? 
Ultimately, what steps do you need to take to protect your idea from the ruthless idea-stealing pirates of the brain? Never fear, help is here. Jeffrey Koss of Polinzi Shugart offers free legal advice in this week's installment of The Drawing Board. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Cass. I'm an attorney at Polsonelli Shugart. Polsonelli is a law firm with offices in 16 different cities, and I try to help startup companies get off the ground all across this great country. You've got this company with the idea. You want to tell your friends because those are the people you talk to most about things. And you might want to talk to your family, potential investors, and you might want to talk to a lawyer. Of course, you know I'd be in favor of that. You're going to be talking to all these people about your ideas. You only want to tell them what they need to know. Friends, you really don't want to share your trade secrets with your friends. If you're sharing your secrets with others, they're no longer secrets. Everybody's heard of NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. An agreement that says, hey, we're going to share some intellectual property with you. We're going to share some secrets of our company. But you're not allowed to tell anybody, not while you work here and not after you leave forever. The only problem you might deal with is if you, if you have a bigger company, let's say you're going to talk to IBM or something like that, and you want to share your idea with IBM because you think they'll want to buy it, and IBM signs a non-disclosure agreement. Now, I have no information that IBM wouldn't honor a non-disclosure agreement, but if they didn't want to honor one, they have a lot more money than a startup company, and they probably would win at the end of the day. I know Starbucks policy is not to sign NDAs, and Starbucks will tell you if they take this idea, they're not going to steal it from you. They're going to use your idea and they're going to work with you. But they don't want to get into a situation where I take the idea to Starbucks and they say, come on, this is a great idea, but you're not the first person to think of this idea. And we've already considered this idea. We may or may not implement it someday, but we don't want to be tied down to an NDA that says, whoa, now we can't use it at all because we signed this agreement with you. So really, you're just going to have to vet out, so to speak, the people you work with. You don't want to just run off, a VC comes along, you're so excited, money, money, money. You're going to want to do research on the VC. You're going to talk to people who know the people in the VC. If you have these trade secrets, and you have, let's just say, an employee, this is the typical case, by the way. Employee knows about the trade secrets, and they go off to go to another company, and they start using the trade secrets in the other company. The best and most inexpensive line of defense, a letter from a lawyer oftentimes is scary enough to stop somebody that knows they're doing something wrong. Let them know that you have a lawyer who knows the area of trade secrets and intellectual property, and believe me, they're gonna look up your lawyer and see who it is, and it's not just uh, my cousin with the same last name. We need you to stop doing this. We want to compete with you fairly. We're not telling you you can't compete with us, but you can't compete with us using our trade secrets. And if you don't do it, you can file a lawsuit against them. The world of startups can be a dicey place, particularly when you're dealing with a sticky subject of privacy. This is not just for big internet companies anymore, but is affecting all layers of business. Joining us tonight is privacy expert Peter Cranstone, who founded a company called 3P Mobile. Peter, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Chris. So, Peter, I, the first question is, I think the most obvious one, is what is privacy? Privacy is about me and having control of my data. That's it. Pretty simple. It is incredibly simple. Explain that to me in the context of most of the internet startups today. Well, they don't have such a thing. <laughs> no, okay. It, it, it's, you get a surprise. You get notified by CNN that 55,000 uh, email addresses were released. And you go, was that one of my email addresses? What it boils down to is transparency. You have to be transparent. You have to be honest. And that drives trust. The more I trust somebody, the more valuable the relationship, the more likely I am to spend more money with you. Tell us a little bit about 3P Mobile and, and how you guys are approaching what is a pretty significant problem. We started six years ago. I've worked with Kevin for 16 years now. And uh, we've only met five times. He lives in Arkansas. I live here in Colorado. Wow. So we've worked together for 16 years. And I called him up and I said, Kevin, I think we have to do another one, another startup. And we always discuss it for about an hour and 15 minutes. 
And in the last 15 minutes is when we decide what we're going to do. So, oh, time out. Of all your startups, four companies, you talk about it for an hour and 15 minutes, and in the last 15 minutes, you go. That's it. It's that is brilliant. Every one of them has been the same way. But if you listened for the first hour, you'd find us all over the place. But in that last 15 minutes, we started talking about the problems with the internet. And when I first worked with Kevin, we did the same process. And we got to the last 15 minutes. And you know what the problem was? Let's make the internet go faster. And that's the days we were on 300 board modems. So we figured out a little piece of software that's now the de facto standard on the internet for accelerating content around the globe. It's been out there for 12 years, no bug reports. It's called Mod G Zip. Google. Mod G Zip. Mod G Zip, Google, Yahoo. So there's like Netflix. four people that actually understand the internet that are going. That's it. Well done. We did, a, we did a good job. So I said, what do you want to do now? And I'm not the one who comes up with the idea. I'm more the muse. You know, I never forget he said this. He said, where's the me button? I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, where's the button that I push that just auto enters all of my information in real time? And we were talking about mobile. Mm. And the really big problem with mobile is back in those days, it, we didn't have the iPhone or Android devices. So there was no way I was going to type in on those little keyboards. All that information. You can't do it. Sure. And then guess what? They never remember it. And now I go back to the website. Mm. Oh my God, I got to type it in all over again. It was, it was tough to get to your Gmail or Yahoo mail. You couldn't do it. Yeah. So obviously we've come a long way, but what we looked at was what are the device capabilities that is interacting with the internet site? So you guys are tackling a big problem. What have you developed to solve it? A context manager. It's a tiny electronic database. You control every aspect of the data that sits in there. It's an app, so it talks to the de device. So I can put a blood pressure monitor on this, and I can read that information. And it goes in my little electronic database, just like my wallet. It's transferable. I can move it around. So now came the hard part. How do we integrate this into the internet? Kevin said, there's a secret. I said, really? Love secrets. So he said, why don't we add it to the protocol? So we went and got the documents out, the Bible of the internet. It, like literally you and four other people have read. Yeah, well, it's probably a few more than now, but okay. you scan down and you get to section 12.1. And it says, you could do this, but then it lists the disadvantages. And the disadvantages are so huge that you wouldn't even bother. But the best part of the hour and 15 minutes is, I don't care. Should we do it? Sure, why not? Let's yeah, just do let's it. Let's try it. So we did it. And remember, in the last 12 years, internet hardware has got incredibly fast. So we're only maybe sending up 20, 30,000 bytes worth of data. Any server can handle that. All we had to do was to figure out how to hop it into the train that was leaving the device. And now, if I was sending it to you and you're the content provider, guess what? You get all of that context incredible rich amount of information that I'm sharing with you. I don't have to type it in. It automatically goes when I go to your website. So, so just so I'm clear, you come and visit me at mobilefy.me, yep. and I know who you are. I already know what information you're going to share, what you're comfortable sharing. Yes. And I can customize my application to your, your wants, needs, desires. Absolutely correct. It's like walking into a restaurant and they know where you want to sit, they know what you want for dinner, they know what you want to drink, and everything is laid out for you. There's nothing new for me to learn. I'm engaging in commerce with you on a trust basis, and I get to control every single aspect of what I send to you. Now, when I leave, I take my data with me. But because you've done such a good job, when I come back, all of the information is now shared. But guess what? This time, I'm in a different part of the country. Well, you could deliver a better different privacy. experience. You can deliver a different experience. Based on different parts of the country, different parts of the world. Different you know what? This time, I've picked up my iPad. Instantly, you see that I'm on an iPad. You know what the resolution is on that iPad. You deliver a different image. So we've got a Twitter question um, from Eli Rugal. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I had to keep it light. OK. <laughs> How does this company compare 
to Microsoft iCards. First of all, tell me what Microsoft iCards are. I'm not sure I know. I'm not sure that I know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But let, let, let me tell you about something I do know about passport. Remember the passport sure. idea? Microsoft said you type all of your information into a passport. One passport. And they store all the data for you. It went nowhere because no one trusted Microsoft with their data. Interesting. And what was fascinating to me is, well, why didn't you just let me control my data? You guys are going after a colossally big problem, yeah. which is making the internet much more customizable. It's not just about privacy, it's about a bigger question, right? The internet becomes contextually aware of me. Of who you are. So how are you guys going about monetizing that problem? We sell software. It's, it's a very simple proposition. Our focus point is right now is the enterprise, but obviously it makes sense for the consumer because it's just a database. Well, I could have a plug-in from Disney. I could have the eBay plug-in. I could have the Starbucks plug-in to my little database. And I can customize my information much like I put information in my wallet, except it's far more efficient now because as I go to these places, they recognize me. And as I leave, all of my information, guess what, leaves with me. And as soon as a con uh, the consumer looks at that and says, I'm in control of my data, Trust level goes Trust up. Trust level goes way up. And then what happens next? Commerce. So for all those people who want to drive value on the internet to solve the privacy problem, let me be in control of my data. It strikes me, and it's funny, and I didn't think about this until right now, but every time you go to a web page, every place on the internet, there is this little thing sitting on your shoulder going, hey, be careful. Yes. You don't, be careful. Oh, you because know you don't know there. what, you don't trust them. That's right. And so if the future of the internet is to change, trust has well, to occur. And, and to that end though, the beautiful part is, is that the trust lies in the big brands of the internet. Yes. As a startup, I have to go out and scratch and claw and fight for that. Yep. Along the internet that you're describing, it's, a, it's an equal playing field. Absolutely. That's the beauty of it for the first time now I can truly have a personal relationship with my customer and they remain in control of their data. So really, what I'm looking at here is the overdrive gear. Where do I engage fifth gear on the internet to turn it into something that's more rewarding, more trustworthy, and something that gives me a far better experience? That's really the goal here. I can't think of a better place to stop than there. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris, today. it's been a pleasure. Join us next week for another episode of Startup, the show for the American entrepreneur. Good, huh?